All right, so we read 1 John 5, and the title of my sermon today is, it's, it's, it's a basic, it's going to be a basic outline of giving the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, you know, we're in a church that is, believes heavily in, in, in every single word, literally, of, of this King James Version of the Bible. We believe that this is the inerrant uh, word of truth, and that's why we've named the church the way we have um, and the reason I chose to read 1 John 5 specifically is um, because one of the first things that, that we go out and do is we're obviously going out door to door, inviting people to church. We, we, we love people coming to church. We want people to come to church. We believe it's a commandment of God uh, for us and everyone that's, that's saved to come to church. Uh, but, but more importantly than even church, we're, we're always asking people, if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to heaven? Uh, there's, you know, we get all different kinds of answers all the time, but this, the specific uh, reason for me uh, reading 1 John chapter 5 is, uh, if you look down at verse number 13, uh, well, let's read it. It says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. So, when we're out preaching the gospel, going door to door, you know, a lot of people say, well, when I ask them the, the question about whether they know 100% for sure, that they're going to heaven, you know, a lot of times they say, well, pff, I mean, nobody knows. Nobody knows for sure. How can you possibly know? Well, the Bible tells us right here that we can know, that we have eternal life, you know, and, and that's how we know for 100% that we're going to be going to heaven when we die, is because eternal life means that we're going to have life that lasts for an eternity. Um, so, it's, it's, the Bible makes it clear, um, and this is how we normally like to start off uh, with preaching the gospel, is asking the question and then showing people in the Bible that it actually does say that we, we can know how to have eternal life. Now, one of the first things I turn to uh, when preaching the gospel, you know, obviously I'm, I'm, I, I like, I mean, the whole goal is to preach the word of God to people that actually want to hear it. So uh, when we're going door to door and trying to get uh, uh, the word out and, and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, um, you know, we're obviously, we're not trying to force anything down anybody's throat. We're not trying to hold them down and tie them to a chair and, and make them sit there and, and listen to what they're saying. You know, they have to be willing. We, we pray, even, even before we go out, we always pray that, that we find people that are willing to hear God's truth. And, you know, we don't want to waste our time trying to force people to listen to something or making them listen to something when they're not going to believe because the whole, the way to get saved is, is to believe, you know? Like, I can't make somebody believe and to waste my time trying to get them to believe when they're not even interested in the first place is, is, that, is, is that. It's a waste of time. So, um, but turn to, if you turn to Titus uh, chapter number 3, Verse number 10, Titus chapter number 3, verse number 10. Titus chapter 3, verse 10 reads, A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition rejects. So, you know, we try to give people an invitation to church. They don't want that. Okay, then we try to uh, ask them the question, if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to heaven? 
You know, they say, oh, you know, we're not really interested. That, according to the Bible, is enough for us to just walk away. Because at that point, you know, they don't, they don't even want to hear what we're going to say. And, and everything in the Bible is true. So, you know, obviously, you, every situation is different. You're going to want to gauge everything on an individual basis. But this is a really good verse to keep in mind when you're just even just starting off a conversation with somebody about the gospel. You know, if they don't want to hear it, th then move on. There's, there's probably somebody else that does want to hear it. And there is. There's plenty of people out there that want to hear the gospel. We just, we have to go out there. We have to, we have to do the work and go out there and preach the word of God like it's taught in the Bible. So, I always like to start off in Romans. One of the first verses that I always, always turn to, and, and you know, it really doesn't matter where you are in the conversation. If the person says that they want to hear what you have to say, you, you just go right into it, you know? Don't, don't waste any time, because you never know what's going to happen, and... Um, you want to make sure you give them the gospel. And, and it's not like, you know, I mean, you can condense it into a five-minute um, uh, sermon or a little spiel that you have or, or whatever you want to call it. But the more time you spend with this person explaining everything, uh, the, the better they're going to understand it and the more likely they are to receive it and believe what you're saying. So always try to, um, you know, be realistic about um, how long it takes. Usually it takes at least ar around 20 minutes to, uh, for me to preach the gospel to somebody. So I try to tell them, you know, it's going to be about 10, 20 minutes. It's, I mean, it's not that very long. I mean... We've already been here for 25 minutes, and, and I really haven't begun to, to preach the gospel. So it goes by really quick. Um, but but you got to make sure that you're realistic because you don't want them to say, you know, oh, well, I only have five minutes. Okay, so if they have five minutes, now you have five minutes to present the gospel, but now you have, you're prepared. You know how much time they have. You know how to condense it. And boom, you just hit the, 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 the most important points that are, or, or get out as many verses as you can in those five minutes. You know, even if somebody gives you one minute, always take that opportunity, you know, always. Uh, so the first verse I like to go to is uh, Romans 3, 23. Very simply says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And I explain it very simply. Basically, we're all, we're all sinners. We don't, we're not perfect. God is the perfect one. He gets all the glory. And we're like, we're way down here. We're all sinners. Nobody's perfect. And always, I mean, I, for the, the two and a half, three years that I've been soul winning, I have not had one person that will disagree with this verse. It's the easiest way to start. Uh, sometimes it, it gives the other person, you know, like a real sigh of relief because they're, they're sometimes they're really apprehensive. They got Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses coming at them. And I would be really apprehensive, too, if somebody came to me, you know, with, you know, like preaching, preaching anything really at this point. But even before I was saved, I'm, I'm really skeptical. I'm going to question everything that they say. So. I like to start off with this verse because it's really simple. Nobody, nobody disagrees with this verse, it, and everybody knows that that, that that is a fact, that we're all sinners. Nobody, not a single one of us is perfect. So, great way to start off. Second verse that I like to go to is also in Romans, chapter number 6 this time, and I only read the first half of this verse, always. No matter what, I'm only reading because I, I like to break down the gospel into two sections, the good news and the bad news. Well, first, I start off with the bad news, then I get to the good news. Um, 
And I, I always try to make the, the, the person that I'm speaking to aware of what I'm doing. We, you know, we're not out there to trick anyone. We're not out there to cause any kind of skepticism uh, other than maybe about their own faith because we're trying to get them to repent and believe on Jesus Christ. So um, Romans chapter number 6, verse 23, first half says, For the wages of sin is death. Now, uh, at this point, I, I've normally asked them if they know what a sin is. If I'm talking to somebody really young, I always pretty much, uh, after I uh, give them, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God in uh, Romans 3.23, I ask and make sure that they know what a sin is. And then in this verse, what I try to explain is wages, because a lot of people will get confused about the way it's worded. Uh, and the two most confusing words will probably be wages and death. Not confusing, they, they just don't understand it because they've never been shown uh, what the Bible is actually saying here. So I explain what a wage is and that how you have to earn uh, or a wage is something that we earn, and the, the most common example I use is always minimum wage because people have heard that term, minimum wage, so they already relate it to working and r doing something or earning it. And, and that's really what a wage is, is what you're earning. So in the Bible, it's explaining here that for the wages of sin is death, that because we sin, we have earned death. Um, and then I always go to uh, Revelations 20. Uh, because when the Bible is talking about death, it's not actually talking about our physical death. It's talking about our soul or our spirit uh, going to a fiery place of torture and torment. And I want to show that to people. Everything I, I say, I want to back up with the Bible. Uh, you always want to use the Bible. The, the Word is what saves people. It's not what you're saying. It's, 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 not, it, it's the actual words of the Bible. It's not how you're explaining the Word or anything like that. So you can do all the explaining you want in the Word, but you have to make sure you're using Bible verses um, to do that, and so that's why I try to show every, everything that I say, I always try to show it in the Bible first, then I explain it. I always show a verse, then I explain it. Um, I, at least that's the format I try to stick to most of the time. Um, so we go to Revelations, chapter number 20, verse 14 and 15. Uh, Revelations, chapter number 20, verse 14 and 15. Uh, reads, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So it's clearly showing that if you're not in the book of life, you're going to be thrown or cast into the lake of fire. I mean, what's a lake of fire? I always, uh, what's the lake of fire? I always ask that. And people most of the time will say hell. You know, um, it's a very simple concept. Usually with kids, with younger children, uh, I'll try to depict a picture. And I say, you know, have you ever seen a volcano uh, erupt on TV or in a picture or something or on, on YouTube and they'll say yeah you know it's like all this lava and 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 that is I mean it, it you 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 watch a volcano erupt I mean you're literally watching a lake of fire so that gives people a, a visual perspective of what hell is now along with that is is torture and torment and um, you know, if you go to Luke uh, chapter number 16, Luke chapter number 16, verses 19 through 24.
It reads, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desir desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And the main thing I, tr I, I want to focus on and, and point out here, and it says when, when uh, the, the rich man died, he lifted up his eyes in hell, being in torment. So here we have a depiction of hell and, 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 and how tormenting it is. So uh, you read further. Let's keep reading. And it says, And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. So... He's being tormented in a flame in hell, and all he wants is a, a little bit of water on the tip of Lazarus' finger to cool his tongue. Like, I mean, I, you can't even imagine. I mean, it gives you a picture of, of hot, how hot hell is, but, but wow. I mean, that, and if, if somebody is not convinced by this, then... then you know, move on. You're the, the, you, have to, you have to get them to believe that, that hell is real. And it is. I mean, it, 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 the Bible clearly states that it's a place of torture and torment. Here we have a, a description of it. And, you know, that's just another place you can turn to when you're trying to show that, that, that our sins will earn us a place in this fiery pit of, of flame and torture and uh, a lake in this lake of fire. So the next thing I try to do is um, I ask another specific question. I say, give me an example, because the, another thing you want to do when you're soul winning is engage the other person. It's very important that you try to, you're, I mean, it's almost like you're having a conversation with this person because they're going to get, sometimes, if you do it long enough, you'll notice they're not listening or they won't pay attention. This, is, this will get them right back to, to listening to you because the whole point is for them to listen to what you're saying about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is a great way to engage them in the conversation. So I ask, you know, give me an example of a sin that you believe uh, God would send you to hell for. And a lot of times, most of the time, uh, people will say murder, and that's usually the 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 one that I'm the one sin that I'm actually looking for. I, I want them to say murder because it fits in perfectly with what I'm going to show them next, which is Revelation 21, verse number eight. It says, "But the fearful." and unbelieving, and the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So we're continuing on this, you know, path to hell. We're showing them what's going to get them to hell. And... You know, they said murderers. If, I mur if they murdered somebody, or if I murdered somebody, anybody murdered somebody, that's going to get them to hell. And God says so. But what I like to try to point out even more specifically, because people think murder is bad, but what I'm trying to show them is that even being a liar is a sin that God says you deserve to go to hell for. And, and this, is, this is the proof right here. It says, And all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. So, maybe they haven't murdered anybody, and maybe they're not a sorcerer um, or a whoremonger, but they've definitely told a lie. And, and what I try to do here, specifically, is ask, how, how many people 
Do you have to murder in order to be a murderer, to be labeled a murderer? And most people will say, well, I don't know, or one. You know, the, the, I mean, the answer is one. If you murder one person ever, you are a murderer. And then I say, well, how many lies do you have to tell in order to be a liar? And they say, one. Obviously, I mean, I've already showed them that being a murderer will get you that label if you've committed one murder. Same thing with a liar or anything else on this list. You do something once against God, you are now whatever you've done. If you steal something, you're a thief. If you murder somebody, you're a murderer. If you lie, you're a liar now. So God says, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. So if you've told one lie, God says, you will have your part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So what is the lake that burns with fire and brimstone? At this point, I mean... I always pretty much get the answer of hell because I've already explained and showed what hell is. Uh, they have already got a picture of hell, um, if, if I've done a good job at least at this point, or if they're, they, and if they were paying attention, obviously. So, so they've realized that telling one lie makes you a liar and that being a liar will get you to uh, or get have your you will have your part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone if you're a liar then I say well are you well maybe not are you a liar sometimes it depends it really depends on the personality but most of the time I'll, I will ask them have you ever told a lie and you know I mean every time here this is just like the the first example where where I show people that nobody's perfect and God's the only perfect one they will answer and say, yeah, of course I've told a lie, you know, like that. I mean, that, they don't even have to think about it. They've, they've told a lie, you know. Um, and, and then I try to, I try to show them that I, I'm also a liar, too, you know. Like, I've told a lie. Uh, whoever my soul winning partner is, they've told a lie. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to show them the, the point. And the point here is, is that everybody has told a lie and and that's not even like I mean that's everybody's told at least one lie you know and I always try to say it that way because there's things that we do that are much worse but God says if you've told one lie that you deserve to go to hell now is that good news or is that bad news you know this is another way to engage um, the person that you're talking to is, uh, you ask him questions you know is that good or bad? Of course that's bad, you know? Like, uh, nobody wants to go to hell. Why would anybody in their right mind that understands what I've just told them, you know, logically, want to even think about going to hell? They don't, you know? So, is that good or bad? No, that's bad, you know? Like, like nobody, nobody, sh nobody wants to go to hell, but we all deserve to go to hell because we've told at least one lie. We're sinners. You know, and that's the point. We are sinners. That's the whole point of the, the, this whole part. Now, th this kind of concludes the, my, my bad news part. Um, so that I always, you know, try to, try to kind of give um, a summary of what I just said. So this is the bad news. You know, we're, we're all sinners. We all deserve to go to hell. But obviously, do you think, do you think uh, God wants us to go to hell? Of course not. So I go back to Romans at this point, Romans 6, 23. And I say, let's go back to Romans 6, 23. And read the second half of that verse. Because I've already showed them the first part. I said, for the wages of sin is death. Now I show them, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So, I try to explain. It shows three things here. That we have to go over what a gift is what eternal life is, and what it means when it says, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
So with the whole gift thing, I, I, I give them an example. I say, if I give you this Bible and say, if you give me a dollar for this Bible, is that a gift? If I say, here you go, you can have this gift, this Bible for free, just give me a dollar. Is that a gift? No. Well, no, of course not. That's an exchange. Now I say, okay, well, what, what if I give you this Bible and say, okay, just, just go ahead and wash my car real quick. Or, or, you know, whatever. Just do whatever, you know. I mean, fill in the blank. You don't, you don't have to use my, what I'm saying. I'm just kind of giving you an example. But it, it works, you know. Can you wash my car? Can you go do something? You're trying to show them, you know, explain works, you know, like it you're trying to separate works from a free gift. Because if you put the two together, a free gift, and add any kind of work or any kind of exchange, that's no longer a gift. That's what you're trying to show here. So um, a gift is free. A gift is paid by the giver. And when you're given something, you have to receive it. If I leave a million dollars at the end of your driveway and say, okay, you can have this million dollars and you ju I, I'll just, I'm just going to leave it here at the end of your driveway, you have to run out there and grab the bag. Otherwise, it's not really yours. So, moving along here, I try to show next and explain eternal life. I just ask, what is eternal? Like, how long does that last? And most of the time, people already know what it means. It means forever or everlasting. They'll even, use, they'll even say everlasting. And then I go, if they do that, I show them other verses. Like, um, I'll show them John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So they've already defined you know, eternal by using everlasting. So it fits perfectly. Normally, you, don't, you won't run into a lot of trouble with uh, eternal people defining eternal. And then through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So I always try to turn to um, uh, Acts chapter number 16, verse 30 and 31. It says, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, there's a lot of things that we should do. We should be a good person. We should go to church. We shouldn't tell lies. We should, um, you know, treat our neighbor as we want to be treated. Um, we should love God. We should follow His commandments. There's a lot of things we should do. But this specific instance, what the, 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 this this, the, the guard here is asking a very specific question. What must I do to be saved? And, and listen to their answer. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. It's really simple. I show them. So, so I say, what do you have to do in order to be saved? What did they say? They said, you have to believe. Does it say here that you have to believe and go to church? No. Does it say you have to believe and um, treat your neighbor like you want to be treated? No. Now, I'm not saying that you should not do all of that stuff. Because, like I said, we should do everything that God wants us to do. We should follow His commandments. But this is talking about... What must I do to be saved? And what you must do in order to be saved is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's very, very simple. So then depending on you know, where they're at at this point, um, I, I show them, I'll show them um, a variety of verses, maybe um, John 3.16, or um, I'll even go to uh, Ephesians chapter number 2, verse 8 and 9. It says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So just reaffirming again that you're not working, it's a gift. Okay, God has given us a gift. 
Um, and then, you know, I, I, try to, I try to just constantly repeat at this point that God's gift is eternal life. You know, just like uh, Romans 6.23 clearly shows us, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So in order to receive the gift, what we have to do, what we must do, is believe on Jesus Christ. Um, You know, probably before this, now that I think about it, um, I, I usually try to uh, also go into the, the doctrine uh, of Jesus Christ. I always try to ask people, either in the very beginning of, of the whole conversation, what they know about Jesus, or at this point, or right before, I always try to um, show the deity of Christ. So I get a good idea of where they're at uh, in, uh, uh, on their facts about Jesus Christ. Because the Bible clearly states that uh, Jesus was the Son of God, but that He was... All and usually people don't have a problem with the Son of God part, but they have a problem with the part that, that He is God. So um, what I like to do is go to 1 John. 1 John uh, chapter number 5, the, the chapter that we read, is a great one uh, because it shows... Uh, in verse number 7, it says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. So it's clearly showing that, that, that we believe in the Holy Trinity. That there's one God, but He has three parts, three manifestations. Another great verse um, for... Uh, Jesus um, being God is John, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, chapter 1, verse 1. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then if you keep reading down to number to verse number 14, it says, And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So then I ask, well, who's, who? The Word was made flesh. So, so in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then the Word, which was God, was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Who's the begotten of the Father? That's the Son, Jesus Christ. So, some examples of um, showing uh, Christ's deity. Another good one that I like to use, if someone's like real direct, you got like a real hard, like, factual, like he wants to see it, like exactly without, you know, jumping around verses or, you know, showing a step-by-step -step kind of a thing. I like to go to um, John uh, chapter number 10, verse number 30. As Jesus speaking, I show them in the red letters, he says, I and my Father are one. So he's, I mean, literally, Jesus Christ is saying that that I and my Father are one. I, you don't get any more direct than that. So you got to really kind of gauge who you're, who you're dealing with. Um, you know, you, the more you do it, the more people you talk to, the more you'll uh, realize more quickly and earlier in the conversation what kind of a personality type that you're, you're dealing with. And, and, you know, some people want like... Um, some people are a little bit more soft-spoken. Some people want hard facts. Some people just want you to get to the point. Some people need a lot of explanation. So you got to be willing and ready, be ready to cater to everything that, that everybody's going to need. Um, so at this point, you know, they know the bad news and they know the good news. Jesus died for their sins. Uh, and what do they have to do in order to receive the gift? They have to believe on Jesus Christ. So I ask them plainly, because this is the, just the kind of person that I am, is do you believe that? 
I, I just literally say, do you believe that? And they either give you a yes or a no answer. Um, I think I've only had one time I went through the whole thing, like the, literally the bad news, the good news. Uh, this girl knew who Jesus was. She had heard the story. And, and, and you know, she was engaging with me. And, and I asked her at this point, I said, do you believe do you believe this? And she says, no, I don't believe that. I, I was just like, at that point, I was shocked. I didn't really like know what to say because she just caught me by total surprise. Um, uh, but I mean, you know, at that point, it's like you, you just got to tell somebody, you got to reconsider. I urge, I urge everybody always to reconsider if they don't believe anything that I'm saying because I'm showing them directly out of the Bible and basically that they're going to go to hell if, if they don't believe on Jesus Christ. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Very plain and simple. Black and white. You know, Jesus, Jesus paid for our sins. He was sent down here to do that, to be the, the sacrificial lamb. And we have to believe on him in order to be saved. Because otherwise, we're paying for our sins in hell. We are sinners. There's no way around it. We have this flesh. So... We'll got to drive it home. You know, be bold. Don't be afraid. Be bold in the word of God. Tell people how it is. If they don't like it, you know, you, you've done your job. You know, our job is to go out and preach the, the, the gospel to every creature. As uh, Turn to Mark 16. Mark 16, 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. This is a commandment. Jesus Christ is commanding all of us to go out into all the, all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That means we should be we should be talking to everybody. Anybody, you, you, you go to the you go to the gas station. You're standing in line. Boom! You should be talking about Jesus. And, and I'm I'm guilty of this. I mean, I don't. I, I try to. We all try. I'm sure we all try to do this, but we should try to do it more. You know, the whole idea is to to the whole purpose for us uh, as a Christian is to win uh, other souls to Jesus Christ and 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 get them. To, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So, at this point, once you know, I get a straight answer, and, and obviously most of the time you're going to get, uh, yes, I, I do believe what you're saying. I, I really want to drive home and make sure that they believe what, what or, or they not only believe, but they really understand the whole idea of the eternal gift, the, 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 the gift of eternal life. Because that is, I mean, let's read uh, 1 John 5, uh, Let's see here. 1 John 5, starting in verse 10, it says, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. So, right here it says that, that if you don't believe God, uh, <coughs> the deity uh, and Jesus Christ and what the Bible lays out that you have made God a liar because you're not believing the record that God gave of his son, Jesus Christ. And this is the record that God had given to us eternal life and this life is in his son. So believing on Jesus Christ it will give you the gift of eternal life. That's how you receive the gift. Another, another scripture you can go to, you know, if somebody's having a hard time believing uh, uh, in Jesus Christ. But, but that, that's the record. The record is that, that, let me read it again. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. So the record is, that he's given to us as a gift, eternal life. Um, so at this point, 
I'm, I want to drive home that they, they understand that. They, uh, they really understand what it means when it says eternal. And I use a very, very extreme example, and you can come up with one on your own, um, but I'm going to give you my example. And I say, okay, and I usually at this point, I know the person's name. I've asked them just by having the conversation with them, and I know their age. If I don't, I say, well, how old are you? And they'll tell me, you know, 12, 25, you know, uh, 19. So I say, okay, let's pretend, just for this example, that I have a friend here, right here, standing, imaginary friend, but he's a real person for this example, and he's 19 years old, and I just gave him all the information, I gave him the gospel, gave him all the information I just gave you, and for the sake of this example, he believed what I told him. Now, we can see his heart, because I can't see your heart, you can't see my heart, God can see our heart, right? And he knows what you believe and what I believe, but for this example, let's say we see his heart, and, and, and Johnny here has believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, he's received the gift of eternal life. Okay, so 10 years go by, or 20 years go by, he's, he's now 39 years old, okay? Uh, Johnny is married, and, you know, one day he gets in a real bad fight with his wife and he goes out to the bar real bad, you know, goes out to the bar, uh, uh, starts drinking, meets another woman there, goes home uh, with her and uh, commits the horrid sin of adultery real bad. Like from the get go, you know, like shouldn't be fighting with his wife, whatever. You know, now he's in this real bad situation. He realizes this, okay? He's like, wow, I just committed adultery. I cheated on my wife, you know? And, and so he gets in his car. Mind you, he's, he's still really drunk. He gets in his car, starts driving real fast like drunk idiots do, and gets, boom, gets in a car accident at, in the middle of an intersection with like two or three other cars, and he kills three people. You know, he's fine, usually as all the drunkards are, um, but he kills three people, and, and he's, he realizes, he gets out of the car, he's, look, you know, trying to paint a real good picture here, like real vivid, real accurate, to, to the point, excuse me, and, and, and just drive the example home. You're trying to show, like, how horrid of a person this is, you know, because of, because of all these sins that they're committing. Like, you're trying to, 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 to show their works and how terrible they are. Um, no, no good works at all. So, you know, he's, he's gotten drunk, he's cheated on his wife, now he's killed three people, you know, so he's, he's, a, he's a murderer, adulterer, drunkard, liar, um, and, you know, he can't take it. He's, he's, he just, you know, all this stuff is happening so fast. All in one night, he can't take it. He takes the gun out of his car and shoots himself. Boom! Johnny is no more. So I asked the question, you know, where, to the person that you're talking to, where is Johnny going? Is he going to hell forever or is he going to heaven forever? And why? And, and at this point, you're going to really get a good idea of what they believe. Uh, and, and because you could have gone through the whole gospel, they could have told you that they believe what you told them, that they believe uh, uh, on the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and that's it, and they receive the gift of eternal life. But then when you give this example, they're going to say, no, no, he's, he's, he's going to hell. And I say, why? Well, I mean, he did all those bad things, but he committed suicide. You know, that's just like an unforgivable sin, right? And I say, well... I mean, and it, and it doesn't matter what they say. I mean, they'll list, you know, you got a list of all these things Johnny did that are bad. It doesn't matter which one they choose or how many of them they choose. The fact is, is I ask them this next question, regardless of what sin they bring up and tell you what excuse they have for believing that he went to hell, I ask, well, did Jesus pay for the sin of suicide, or the sin, of, or adulterers, or liars, or fill in the blank. Whatever your example is, I mean, it, it'll work for, for anything. Did he pay for that sin? And 
He did. He paid for every sin. Jesus paid for the sins of the whole world. So, it, it, at that point, it really either like clicks or it doesn't click. You, know? you, really, you really see, you can gauge where you're at with this person uh, based on the answer that they give you. So from that point, you can, um, you know, depending on where they're stuck on, you're going to have to cater to what they're getting hung up on, and whether it's the deity of Jesus Christ or whether it's... Um, you know, that they're not convinced that uh, uh, suicide is, uh, uh, you know, an unpunishable death or, or not. Pun I, I don't really know how to say that, I guess. Well, b b but the fact is, is Jesus paid for all sins, you know. So um, that usually clicks. Um, normally, from there, I go to, uh, uh, I, you know, if, if I'm speaking to an adult, um, I always like to give uh, the example of uh, their children. So another example that you can use to uh, show people how, how this all works is use their children, you know. Uh, and if they don't have children, they are a child. So they have parents. And, and people that uh, don't have children will still understand this example. It's a, a really good example to get them to understand um, that... Um, G, or God will not throw you into hell for committing sins once you believe on Jesus Christ. Because uh, it's, the, it's the same way with, with, a, with a parent and a child. When, when you have children, you always have rules for your children. Do, the, do your children always follow your rules? No, they don't. That's always going to be the answer that you get. Children do not always follow. In fact, they seldom follow their parents' rules until they start learning what it means to follow their rules. So um, it's the same way with God, you know. God has rules for us. Once we believe on Jesus Christ, we are now a child of God. And you can go to um, 1 John or John... Uh, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, chapter 1, verse number 12 says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So right here it's saying that we have the power to become the sons of God. Uh, and once we believe on Jesus Christ, we have now become a child of God. So just like you have children, God is our Father and we're His children and He has rules for us. Just like you have rules for your children and we don't always follow God's rules. Just like your children don't always follow your rules. Now, this is a real key point. You ask them, have you ever, like think of the worst thing your child has ever done. Have you ever taken the, uh, them and thrown them in the oven and turned it on high and just left them in there to burn in basically physical hell forever? You know, like just burn them up physically. No, of course not. They would never do that. A loving parent is not going to do that ever. That's not even a question. That's not even a, that's not even a possible solution for anything. You know, like, and, and that's what I say. That, that's, that's perfect. That's exactly how it is with God. You know, once we believe uh, that Jesus Christ paid for all of our sins, we have now received the gift of eternal life. Eternal means forever. Just like you will never... Throw your child in the oven for doing something that you don't like or that's against your rule. Same way with God. He will not throw us into the pit of hell, you know, with torture and torment forever. A lake that burns with fire and brimstone forever because we don't do something that he wants us to do. Now, God has the ability to punish us and reward us on this earth. And that's what he will do. Just like you reward your kids and punish them on this earth based on their actions. He's God, our Father, is going to do the same thing. So, you know, it's, um, there's, there's a lot of different ways that you can um, approach the, the gospel um, and present it. Uh, hopefully I've given you 
uh, at least somewhat of an outline on um, you know what I do and and if you haven't learned anything maybe uh, you, you you've gotten an example or you've heard something in a way that that you haven't heard before and if you're a new believer and you're trying to learn um, how to give the gospel you know I, I I've I've pretty much given you my outline of how I um, how I do it and how I approach it. Um, so, you know, the best thing to do um, is when learning how to preach the gospel, first thing I would recommend is find somebody that's done it, you know, um, and ask them for like a list of all the verses that they use. And once you get that list, just memorize it. Memorize where it is in the Bible, exactly where it is in the Bible, and what the verse says. Um, and once you do that, you know, obviously you want to become a silent partner for a little, for a little bit. And, and really, the best way to um, refine your soul winning skills is to really just kind of jump in head first and, and just go out there and just get it done because God will, will shape you and mold you to the soul winner that he wants you to be. And, um, you, know, a bit, you know, even from my experience, once I started to really like get my hands dirty with the soul winning and trying to go out there and, and actually doing a lot of talking and doing the talking, it wasn't perfect and it's never going to be perfect. You just got to fight through it and uh, have faith that God's going to get you through it and teach you, um, teach you how and when and what to say uh, using his word. So... Um, with, with that, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, thank you for this time that I had to uh, preach your word and, and possibly, hopefully, show um, you know, new believers or other believers uh, something that they haven't learned or at least given them an outline uh, of, of, of how to preach, um, preach the, the gospel of your precious Son, Jesus Christ. Um, you know, uh, I, I definitely pray for um, more salvations and that we can all learn and um, be edified in, in church and we all come to church to, to learn more about your son and your word uh, in order for us to become uh, better soul winners and more um, efficient and productive uh, in this lifetime. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.